And when we started our program on new economic theory, the more we discussed new uh, theory in economics, the more we found out that it's not just a question of debating uh, orthodoxies or, or uh, the validity of theories. It really came back at many respects to fundamental issues of how we think. We started looking at the work of William Byers, who did a webinar with us. He's a Canadian mathematician who wrote a couple of very interesting books, one of them on deep thinking. And I, I found a quote in one of his books, what looks like a series of disparate crises is really one crisis that manifests itself in various ways. And he was talking about global crises, which I'm going to do and we have been doing. All one all encompassing crisis that arises from inner contradictions that are inherent in modern culture. And the context for buyers in his book was they're not only inherent in modern culture, but they're inherent in the way we think as part of modern culture. And so essentially saying our problems result from the way we think. In 2013, we conducted a conference, some, most of you or many of you know about it, at Geneva with the United Nations on global challenges in the, uh, in, and uh, the need for a new paradigm. And in the way we started the conference was to say our research on global challenges uh, came up with five generalizations, five things we found in common among these global challenges, which were otherwise quite disparate uh, in their application. I'm talking about uh, the, the security problems that we have and the nuclear arms race, which was, which was there, the financial crisis, which we still hadn't recovered from 2008 crisis, and we hadn't recovered by 2013, the rising unemployment, uh, the rising instability of the financial markets, rising inequality. And of course, we really hadn't become fully aware of what was going to happen to democracy, uh, the retreat from democracy, the polarization of society, the retreat from multilateralism, and of course, climate change. And we had no idea that the pandemic was around the corner. But we concluded about leaving the pandemic aside for a minute, though it's equally valid, we concluded five things that all of these have something in common. One of them is that they're all global in nature and they cannot be addressed at the local or national level effectively because of the close interdependence between countries and people and economies, societies around the world. The second was somewhat disconcerting that the current policies and institutions we have, not just the, the policies, but the institutions were such that uh, they cannot be addressed without radical change in both policy and institutions. Our third was that they cannot be effectively addressed with fund without fundamental changes in our educational system. And it was at that conference that we came up with the idea of a new paradigm in education that led to the founding of the World University Consortium. The fourth one was that these problems are so deep seated, they go right back to the theory on which we are not only educating, but researching, but formulating policy and implementing policy in the world. So without fundamental changes in theory, and I'm particularly talking about the social sciences, we're not going to successfully address these challenges. And the fifth one coming to the point was, these problems are a, a result of the way we think. And without fundamental changes in the way we're thinking, we're not going to address them either. By that time, we had done a lot of work in the field of new economic theory, written many papers and constituted uh, a working group of more than 50 people. We've since then, we've run about five international conferences on it. And with reference to economy, it was pretty clear that you have to go all the way back to the logic of, uh, it's not just a question of orthodoxies, uh, how logical is our approach to economy? What are the objectives of our economy? What are we measuring? 
and, and what are we getting? A pretty obvious example would be in efficient market theory. Uh, we have markets that are supposed to be efficient, but efficient for what purpose? To maximize the efficiency of the market or to maximize the benefits to the society. And, and they're not the same thing. The efficient market theory maximizes value according to the way we are measuring value. And I think we all know now that the way we're measuring value is fundamentally flawed. What we call gross domestic product, uh, our fellow Hazel Henderson uh, uh, calls grossly distorted product uh, uh, because it really leaves out all the externalities that are fundamental to our existence, the, those of society and those of uh, the, the ecology and environment around us. So out of this, we came to the conclusion that if you look at the way I'm taking the economy just as an example, it's not my subject, but it's something we've spent a lot of time on. We said we have a fundamentally, we have a, a divorce in the way we are managing our society, a five-fold divorce with reference to economy. One is we've got a financial system that was created to support the real economy and has become so independent and actually divorced from the real economy that success of the financial committee, uh, uh, the financial sector uh, can be consistent with uh, serious problems and increasing problems uh, and disintegration of the economy itself, rising unemployment, rising inequality, uh, uh, rising economic instability. And in fact, we are experiencing uh, all of those things. We have a divorce between our development of technology, which is supposed to be creating better, greater well being and welfare for the society, uh, but it's also divorced from the society in which we live and a lot of our technological application, let alone that which goes towards destructive purposes like building more nuclear weapons, uh, uh, it, it goes to displacing people with an economic system that has no solution to what do we do when we introduce new technology and it displaces people and they have no work and no way to earn their living. And of course, the, the most obvious of these divorces is we have an economic system that's divorced from the, the world in which we live, the planet on which we live, and it prices natural resources at the course of extracting them, not at their, not at their inherent precious value, irreplaceable value to the future of life on earth. Then I, I need not go further. I'm only trying to give this background to say that the topic we're discussing today is a fundamental relevance to all the topics that the, have been concerned to the academy. In fact, it's interesting to note if you go back to the origins of the academy, as we discussed in the Wasit 60 conference a couple of months ago, the whole thing started because dedicated, sincere, brilliant scientists who were concerned about peace uh, and the future of peace in the world and freedom in the world uh, band together to create nuclear weapons uh, and then found out a few years later that they have opened Pandora's box and let the genie out or whatever is in her box. And uh, uh, the result is that we've been living for the last 75 years over the nightmare of uh, nuclear weapons that arrived that were created by the application of mind without realizing the potential implications of what we were doing. Uh, and it finally led to that wonderful phenomenon we call mutually assured destruction or MAD, uh, very well named, uh, in which we built, the Soviets and the Americans built 70,000 nuclear weapons just to be sure that if we ever wanted to, we could destroy each over uh, each other a hundred, ten thousand times over. So, going back to Bayer's original quote, uh, it's not enough that we say somebody made a policy error here. It's not a. It's not enough that the scientist has done his job, but somebody else 
uh, has done something. We have to at least look and ask ourselves, does this have something to do with the way we think or more than something? And that's how we came to this project. And that's been the, the logic behind our work in education, on global governance, on the global leadership and so forth. So uh, that's by way of background. Uh, the topic itself, I'd like to say a few very fundamental themes. The topic is big, but I think I can give a very brief, broad outline to make a few simple points out of the many that could be made. Uh, and I wanna start with the basic question, what is thinking? I'm gonna take a very simple, basic, non-technical, no uh, jargon or anything way of looking at this. Thinking, if you look at it very fundamentally, is connecting things together. The mind connecting things together. And what do we connect together? We connect lots of different things. We, we have two sensations. Uh, we hear uh, a, a sound of thunder and a few seconds earlier, we saw a bolt of lightning. And after some time, we begin to think whether, how come every time I see lightning, uh, I, uh, thunder is there? Is it Thor and Zeus having a battle or some gods in the heavens and with different weapons? Or what's the relationship between these two? And this simple idea of relating the sensations that we have or the memories we have. I meet somebody and I say, you know, this person looks like somebody I've met before. And I try to reconnect them in my mind. Somebody looks like this or talks like this, or uh, this has happened before. We connect objects together and compare apples and oranges and dogs and cats. We look at people, we compare them, we connect them actions, events, feelings, facts, all types of things. And in a fundamental way, in the most rudimentary way, thinking is about forging relationships, of course, mental relationships between objects. And of course, that doesn't mean that the relationships are valid. It doesn't mean valid in a, a factual or scientific way, they're valid in our mind. And it was a long time before we really came around to distinguishing between the valid ones and those that were just, uh, were not particularly like the black cat uh, walking under the ladder or the broken mirror and the bad luck and the bad news of what happened later. We associate lots of things. Today, we call it superstition. Uh, all those connections that have been made, which now we don't think we can reproduce in the lab, uh, or something, uh, but it's all the, the fundamental thing was making connections. That those thoughts, th those give us the primary, and then we take those primary observations or relationships, and we relate them to one another. And I've taken a, a simple example here. Uh, what uh, uh, Steve. Uh, Bosniak did, uh, he was the first one to take a, a keyboard and a, and a TV screen or a TV monitor and connect it in creating a PC. Uh, it's a simplistic way of looking at, you take the functionality of the typewriter and the functionality of the television, of course, with a lot of microelectronics behind it. And you've got a new concept here, you've got a new thought and it gives rise to a PC revolution. And then we also take thoughts and we connect them together. We connect them at higher levels to build more complex ways of thinking, which we call ideas. We take all our thoughts about governance or government and our thoughts about elections or freedom, we put them together in different ways and we get an idea we call democracy or the will of the people or uh, countless others. And then we take these ideas and we also combine them together. We also link them together in relationships and try to get more synthetic, higher level ideas uh, that are related to each other. And if we're Einstein, we come up with concepts like E equals MC squared. We've got energy and matter. And you have to remember that energy and matter seem to be things that were totally unrelated up until about 1890. I mean, what could be more different 
than this hard, stable, uh, inert object. And this energy that most of it's not even visible. Uh, uh, and how could they possibly be related to each other? But a conceptual system is created that discovers the relationship. So I'm, I'm starting this way in a very basic way, just to kind of build up from the basics that fundamentally thinking is about relations. And we have all different types and orders of thinking that build in very complex ways, as we know. And those, the types of thinking, there are many ways to categorize them. I'm not trying to be academic or complete about it, but just for illustration. The original thinking would have been just observation of thunder and lightning, for example. But then we develop something, we develop symbols to represent things. It's a new type of thinking, symbolic thinking. Suddenly the sound represents something other than the sound. The, the painting, the art painting in the cave represents something other than the, 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 the colors that are uh, on the wall. Uh, the, the sequence of sounds in our speech represents something other than noise, it represents a sequence of significance. And our symbolic thinking has multiplied and gone so high. And of course, we finally went to the ultimate uh, symbols of thinking, uh, mathematical symbols, purely abstract symbols that don't represent anything physically. They can be used to represent something, but in themselves, they, they're not physical things. And that in order enabled us to develop higher and higher order thinking. And then, and we would take this for granted, uh, except that uh, the evidence is it took us a long time to realize that just because you put two ideas together doesn't make them really related to one another. It doesn't mean that uh, the thunder caused the lightning or the lightning caused the thunder for that matter, uh, just because they come together or that the cat was really the cause of the, uh, uh, of the misfortune that had happened. And to develop causal thinking, to, to link cause and effect in some systematic way, and to develop rules for discriminating the purely coincidental uh, occasion when things happen together or we link them together in our mind. And we still do that a lot. We associate things that are not causally related. Uh, we need some rules for that. And sometime we know from the Greeks, we don't know how far back it may have been before that, but we know they decided to develop rule-based thinking where it's not just enough that you link objects together, but you link them according to certain rules to validate whether the conclusions you come to are valid or not. Again, I'm speaking in a very basic way to build up to something bigger that I hope you'll find relevant. So on this basis, I'd like to talk about four types of thinking, higher order types of thinking or higher categories of thinking that are built on this foundation. The first of them is uh, what we call empirical thinking, which is really the basis for uh, the birth of modern science. And it was natural that our early thinking depended very much on our observations of the world around us through our physical senses. All our early thinking, or let's say for a long time until philosophy developed in abstract thought, our early thinking was based on uh, the relationship between sense impressions and the validity of things because they were related they were observable physically. Uh, and of course, long, long time ago, we started to create words and concepts for things that weren't physical and could not be uh, validated or experienced physically. And that became the whole basis for religion, which goes back a very long time. But if we talk about the modern era, it was in the time of Copernicus uh, and, and Galileo, that we really began to question more systematically that what our senses tell us may not be true. 
it's not, it's very obvious to all of us that the sun is going around the earth, that we're standing still and the sun is moving around us. It's empirically obvious any fool knows that it's true, except, it, and, and we believed it was true for uh, thousands of years with a few exceptions uh, uh, back then. Uh, and then we, until Copernicus proved and showed that actually, if you really want an accurate calendar, you have to make a very opposite conclusion that what our senses tell us is not the reality. And we learn a fundamental thing that we all learn as kids, don't judge a book by its cover uh, and uh, whatever, just because something looks to be some way, it's not necessarily that way. And that led to the development of higher order thinking in science, uh, particularly the analytic thinking, to try to have a way to validate uh, the validity of our physical observations and demonstrate they not only appear to be true, but they meet some other tests or rules of, 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 of thinking. And that led to the development of analytic thinking. And a simple way of describing analytical thinking is, analytic thinking is to say, we take reality and we divide it into parts. And then we take each of the parts and we name it and we categorize it and we divide it into smaller parts. And we study each of these things as much as we can, taking each of it as a subject in itself. And we look for the causality that comes from the smallest parts. So if matter has certain uh, behavior, if our, uh, a tree or a stone or uh, a gas or whatever it is, we try to reduce it from its external appearance and its external properties. We reduce it to its molecular structure. Eventually we reduce it to its atomic structure. And we say everything starts with the atom. And now we've reduced the atom to uh, a, a microcosm of subatomic particles interacting with each other in energy going around itself. It's not really particles at all. And we build up our whole concept of the physical universe from these tiny little particles. And analytic thinking has been a, the resource of tremendous discoveries and advances uh, in the world. I mentioned only a handful we have the periodic table of the elements, which was based on an, an analysis of all of the different properties uh, of, the, of the elements. We've got the standard model of the atom. We have the structure of molecules and different types of molecules and classifications and categories. We have the classification of species into phyla, the plant and animal uh, phyla. And then that led to the genetics of breaking down uh, and trying to explain uh, what we are strictly from its origin in the molecular DNA and the, and the subcomponents of, uh, uh, of DNA. And we've done that with physiological processes. We've done that with computer commands and, and so forth. And it's given us tremendous advances that can never be denied. Uh, and we built the modern world on it. But there are some inherent limitations in analytic thinking. Uh, in reducing everything, trying to get down from the complexity of the whole to its basic constituent parts, I gave the example of the body, because if we follow the logic of analysis far enough, uh, the way we'd explain the body is it's 20, it's 57% hydrogen or 57% water. Uh, and that's true as a fact, but it doesn't really tell us much about the body or why it is what it is or how it functions the way it does. In the process of reducing it to smaller and smaller things, we've not only gained some knowledge about what this body is made of, but we've lost a lot of information or ignored a lot of information in the process that tells us this is inadequate. We are not just 57% water. Well, this is what we've done with our disciplines also. Today, or I'd say about five years ago when I checked, there were a thousand, more than a thousand sub-disciplines being taught in American universities. 
I don't know how many of them were in engineering or in medical science, but we have, in, even in economics, we have uh, uh, so many. Uh, uh, in, in, in every field, we've split up in more and more into sub-disciplines. And it's come to the point where to be an expert in a sub-discipline, you really cannot be very knowledgeable about the rest of your own discipline because there's so much that's been learned from our analysis and let alone being knowledgeable about other disciplines. And I had a, a good dramatic example of this myself. Uh, when uh, a few years ago, I met a very leading economist from Yale. We were attending a conference together in Europe uh, and he happened to be a labor economist and I was looking for some friendly topic to relate to him on. I said, oh really? Well, you know, we've done a lot of work on employment in the academy. And he, and so I, I said, and I started talking to him about it. And he said, well, you see, I'm a labor economist. I don't really know much about employment. Professor at Yale, labor economics is different from the economic discipline, his job is only to wonder how labor unions work and how wages are fixed uh, and how arbitration takes place, how jobs are created or how the economy grows and how it's the impact of technology on employment or law on employment that was outside his field. So I'm taking, this is an extreme case, but a, a real case of what happens when we mistake analysis for reality. We can get great insights from the reality, the, the analysis, but when we mistake our analysis for the reality and we develop a conceptual system based on that, we end up leaving out a tremendous amount of knowledge. And that's of course what's happened with our economics, which has left out the society, left out the human being, left out the ecology uh, left out, you know, the original ec economics was called political uh, economy uh, because originally they realized that the, the, the way an economy works depends very much the way the government works. Well, over the 19th century, the economists got so carried away with the industrial revolution. Economics is not about government, it's about production, it's about industry, it's about technology. It's about capital investment and all. And they created a whole independent field. Today, economics is as dependent on the political system as it was 200 years ago, uh, in spite of the fact that we have so many other fields and we see that every day now. But our economic theory to a very large extent is fragmented. We have the example of in the last 30 years, two Nobel Prizes were given for economists who developed computer algorithms that were used in computerized trading. And those algorithms were the basis for uh, the financial crisis, the East, East Asian financial crisis in the late 90s, and the uh, one of the causes of the financial instability that we've had since because the way the financial market works or the way a computer program estimates or estimate or predicts the rise or fall in value on the stock market is unrelated to what's beneficial for the economy, what's beneficial for employment, what's beneficial for society or what's beneficial for humanity because it's become so specialized. So very powerful given us great things, but if we take that, if we mistake the analysis for reality, we end up with problems. So the second, one of the solutions to that has been, well, mind can divide things into smaller and smaller parts, but mind can also assemble things and aggregate them together. So now that we've divided reality into so many parts, why don't we try to construct ways to put them all back together like Humpty Dumpty and connect things together because everything's connected to other things. And so we start assembling and aggregating. And this was the basis for systems thinking and systems knowledge, which has had profound impact on uh, 
our, our thinking and our science and our society in the last hundred years, particularly the last 75 uh, years. And it recognizes more and more the complexity of the relationships between all of these parts. And it strives to create an, an idea of the whole. And as analysis has been extremely powerful tool for creating, system science has done miraculous things. And it's a very short list. Uh, our weather forecasting is the result of system science. Our internet is the, wouldn't, it couldn't exist without systems thinking. Uh, our population projections, our climate projections, and artificial intelligence. So these are very, very powerful tools. What could possibly be the problem that Byers thinks that we still have a problem with the way we think? Well, systems thinking has done great things. And I emphasize the positive because I'm not trying to disparage any of these things. I'm trying to say, I think the evidence is that this type, these th this empirical thinking, this analytic thinking, this systems thinking are not sufficient to eliminate the problems that we have. That's what I'm trying to build up through by going through in a very uh, structured but su superficial way. Well, what's wrong with systems thinking? It's very powerful. We're all trying to learn it. Uh, well, there's a tendency in systems thinking. It, you don't have to say it's inevitable, but if we look at the way it's being applied, it inevitably reduces things to mechanical models. This is connected with that, this interacts with that. The system concept itself is a mechanical model. And I'll say a little more to, uh, to make that. Using systems, we try to understand from neurophysiology, which is a system science, our human behavior. We try to develop models that explain are all types of human behavior and in terms of mechanistic uh, systems. Uh, it does something else though. There is a, the problem with systems are, and the problem with taking these parts and relating them together is, it works very well with physical objects or measurable objects or objective phenomena like impulses and events, but it doesn't work very well when it comes to the subjective reality. Because the subjective reality, it's hard to put your hand on it, it's hard to see it, it's hard to quantify it, and yet it's so important to the reality we live in. And a brief story would be a lot easier than long explanations to make the point. Uh, an example I've written about and used elsewhere. In the 1930s, when Franklin D. Roosevelt became president of the US in January uh, or March, I forget now, that time uh, of, two, of 1933, the great crash had taken place in, in 29. And for four years, the Federal Reserve and the government applied their knowledge of economic systems to try to stop a banking panic. After the crash, bankruptcies, failures, suicides. It led to the failure of banks and those banking failures multiplied and one after another failed and people rushed to the bank to withdraw their money from it. And that made more banks fail. And when Roosevelt became president, this was the gift that he found waiting on his doorstep, kind of like Biden today inheriting uh, the pandemic uh, at the height of the pandemic. And the problem he had was he didn't have a vaccine around the corner uh, that was supposed to be uh, the answer for him. They had exhausted all the answers. The, the economic science has essentially exhausted every known policy that could address this issue uh, over the previous four years. And the bank failures were only uh, increasing. And FDR said at that time, there was nothing he had learned in his economics courses at Harvard that prepared him for this crisis. Fortunately, he was an astute human being and politician. And he knew something that seemed to have missed 
seem, seem to not have been clear to those who were formulating the economic policy under Hoover. He understood that fundamentally, the problem is not an objective problem with the banks. The problem fundamentally is the people, the American people have lost confidence in the system. They're frightened and terrified and they're panicking and they're rushing to the banks to withdraw their money. And the more they withdraw their money, the more the system fails. The cause is subjective, it's not an objective. The cause is a lack of trust and confidence in the system. And so he got on the radio and he addressed the American people six days after becoming president. And he said, look, nothing has changed in our country. We're supposed to be courageous people, bold people. We built up this nation with our hands. Nothing has changed. The only thing that's changed is we've lost confidence in ourselves. His famous words, you have, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And he said, on Monday, I'm going to ask you to go back to the banks where you were all lining up to withdraw their money. Uh, in. They would have all taken it out, but it took so long to take out that banks stayed open longer. And he said, I want you to put your money back in the bank. We have to restore our confidence in America and ourselves and our banking system. That's the only solution for, for us. And in fact, the banking system was saved and the crisis was reserved, was reversed. And I tell this story, there are thousands we could tell just to illustrate the point that when it comes to complex systems, the basis of those systems are not the visible things we see only. I'm talking about social systems, human systems, economic systems, political systems. We have enough experience in the US to know that it's not the physical reality of, uh, it's not that the, the elections were stolen by fraudulent means. It's that somebody convinced the people to be afraid or convinced that the elections were stolen. It was the subjective reality that determined uh, 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 the objective reality. And systems science is not very good at handling the subjective reality, which when it comes to human beings is what part of our reality? <laughs> I leave it to you to assign percentages or importance. What is really the most important thing? The way our body functions and our physical activity or the way we think, which is a subjective phenomenon uh, or the way we feel or the energy with which we act. And one other very important thing which is usually over missed in the social sciences, systems thinking works with data. It works with statistics. It cannot handle the role of the individual. It, it works with averages and, uh, and all. It, it works with patterns. What do you do when you get an FDR who becomes the president of the United States? Can you predict what's going to happen the next day? When Steve Jobs went back to Apple in 1996, when it was failing, and uh, Michael Dell had said, um, Apple will be closing in six months. It's going to become bankrupt. It's lost 75% of its market. Uh, and there's nothing Steve Jobs can do about it. He better tell the shareholders and give them, liquidate the company and at least give them back something before it's too late. Who could imagine Bell, who very knowledgeable guy, knows all the objective facts, knows all the financials, knows the market, knows uh, all the data available in the world on the microcomputer industry, uh, the PC industry and all, who could imagine that within 10 years, Apple will be 12 years, the most valuable company in the history of the world. It wasn't the objective data. It wasn't the financial statements. It wasn't even market share or market growth that was gonna do this. It had to do not only with subjective factors, that Jobs actually believed something could be done. It had to do with one individual. And I don't mean one individual alone, with many who were not just a clone of somebody else, who were not just doing like adding one more person to the pie. They were adding something unique. And our systems thinking doesn't really help us very much in dealing with uniqueness. It deals with statistics. It deals with generalizations. About five, six years ago, I was invited to do a colloquium at CERN, uh, 
uh, and we were we had an MOU with CERN, and we were trying to find some way to relate to uh, the CERN scientists. They're they're mostly they're engineers. They're uh, related to uh, the subatomic particles and how to find a topic to talk to physicists at CERN. I was a bit in a dilemma, and so I came up with a strategy. Uh, there were about 50 scientists in the room. And I said, you know, I want to talk to you about what the social sciences can learn from the physical sciences. And everybody brightened up and said, oh, well, this was an interesting topic. We were afraid you were going to talk about world history or economics or something like that. Now you're talking, you want to learn from us about what makes for a science. And then I said, look at the integration that's there in the natural sciences. You wouldn't dream whether you're a geologist or a meteorologist or uh, an astrophysicist or uh, 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 a biologist, a physiologist, a veterinarian, whatever it is. You wouldn't dream of ignoring the discoveries of other disciplines. You wouldn't think of creating the laws of physics to meet with your you wouldn't in invent new laws of physics for meteorology. You would go to the basic laws of physics and see what they tell us and how it applies to meteorological events. You wouldn't try to change or ignore the laws of chemistry. Well, in the social sciences, we've got economists creating our homo economic, econom economics, uh, who's supposed to be a rational human being. And I'm sure the psychologists are very generous. Uh, uh, jealous uh, about the economists. How come you get all the rational human beings? We've been searching for rational human beings for decades and we've never found one. But the economist feels quite content creating a, a theory of how economy works based on rationality, principles of human behavior that don't match with the evidence of psychology. So I finally this is how I started and I built up from there. And I finally said, you know, uh, I think one of the things that we can learn from the physical sciences is that there's a big difference between the physical and natural sci and, and social sciences. Because the complexity that you deal with in the physical sciences, which seems to be very great when you're dealing at the subatomic level, is nothing compared with the complexity that we deal with in the social sciences because you're only dealing with physical facts. You're not worried about attitudes and habits and beliefs and prejudices and human aspirations uh, and uh, misconceptions and superstitions. You're simply looking at physical phenomena. And in the social sciences, we not only have to look at social phenomena and psychological phenomena and cultural phenomena, but we also have to take into account human differences and even human uniqueness. And therefore, what would you do in physics if every quark was of a different color? Instead of having five or six types of quarks, you had eight billion types of quarks and each one has its own unpredictable characteristics. Well, we had a good discussion, but I use this to illustrate. Fundamentally, the tools we're using uh, have, however powerful they are and however much knowledge they've created, they can also be a source of problems for us. Maybe they are the fundamental source of all the problems we have. I won't try to argue that today, that requires a more, but certainly we have enough evidence that they are a source of a lot of problems. E economics function for 180 years without worrying about what's the impact on the environment, without thinking that we have to widen our extent Behind the, beyond the economic system. So what's beyond that? And this is a big topic, what's beyond that? Is there something beyond that? Well, there's something beyond that that we can see, that we can experience. And there are some things beyond that which are still in the range of uh, beyond scientific valid validity, even though every leading scientist talks about them. What I'm going to talk about as the next level of science is integrated or organic thinking. I contrasted organic thinking with 
systems thinking in the sense that organic implies that we realize we're dealing with living systems. We're not just dealing with mecha mechanical things. And by living, I don't just mean a biology of a plant. I mean the biology of a human being. A company is not a mechanical organization. A company is a living, organiz a, a living organism that not only does things physically, it not only relates to other people and objects and produces and sells, uh, it feels, it thinks, it values, it acts uh, in, and in many unique and individual ways. And the systems thinking, the analytic thinking is not adequate for us. To, that's why management has not become a science up until now, because we don't know how to handle an organic living thing, a, a living organization. We know how to handle a system, a mechanical organization. So what do I mean by integral thinking is a thinking that sees the whole, to quote Aristotle, as something greater than the sum of its parts. We know that the human body is more than just the 57% H2O and a certain amount of hydrogen and uh, or nitrogen and other uh, uh, chemicals uh, in there. We know it's more than that. We know it consists of cells, billions of cells. We know also that those cells consist of uh, or make up tissues, and those tissues make up organs, and those organs link together into create systems. You know, it's really interesting if you think about it. If any of you are uh, into physiology and anatomy or uh, in, in, any, in any field. It's very interesting because when you learn about the systems like the digestive system, the respiratory system, uh, the uh, nervous system, muscular system, uh, and, and so forth, uh, it looks really neat and clean. Oh, now I understand the human body. We got this system, that system, and they all go together somehow. But actually, when you go into the body, there is no such thing. The system is a conceptual system. It's not a real system. The heart, the, the, the respiratory system, the circulatory system, and the metabolic system are inseparable from each other. You can't say, this is the respiratory system, that's the metabolic system, this is the uh, circulatory system. You can't separate it from the muscular system or the nervous system or the hormonal system, the lymphatic system. They, every one of them is consisting of all of them. They're all there, but the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And the body, when you put it all together, let alone the fact that we're conscious human beings, and when I'm afraid of getting a, a, a disease, I may tend to get it. And when you give me a piece of candy and tell me it's a cure-all for everything, I may be cured by it because our mentality is also, we're dealing with a very, the most complex thing in the universe, as far as we know it anyway. The human being is the most complex thing in the whole universe. And the thinking that works for understanding lightning or the laws of motion or the thermo, laws of thermodynamics uh, or the laws of uh, how to uh, robotics and how to program a robot uh, or, or run a computer simply are not sufficient to handle the complexity and the multiple layers of reality going ultimately to the unique individuality. And, and what it makes us do is it makes us deny our individuality. We're taught in the social sciences, uh, to a very, even in psychology, to look at our generality, what type are we in, uh, what syndrome do we have, rather than to look at the fact that every human being really has the uniqueness. So what do we do? What type of knowledge and thinking do we need that can handle the truths of our subjective reality and the truths of our individual uniqueness, which are demonstrated in our lives right before our eyes all the time? How do we develop that? Well, obviously, it's a lot easier to learn the three R's and uh, math, arithmetic, and, uh, and analytic science. It's a lot easier to cut things up and chop Humpty Dumpty 
uh, into many pieces and try to piece together the, the jigsaw puzzle, then it is to handle the most complex phenomenon in the universe. But isn't it a big mistake if we try to reduce ourselves to something less of a reality than we really are? Aren't we leaving out knowledge, consciously ignoring knowledge? There's a beautiful book on statistics. I forget it. I can share the reference with anybody who wants it, uh, 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 where he argues that when the, farm, when the medical doctor is forced to use computer programs with artificial intelligence to uh, diagnose a disease and even prescribe remedies for it, he's dealing with generalized data. He's dealing with generalized statistics. And, and the, 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 the resident pharma uh, uh, physician who says, look, the system is telling me that this is the treatment. But I know that's not the thing that's going to work for him. The guy had a divorce yesterday. Uh, and it, it's not the, uh, it's not the, this is not the problem for him. There are other factors that you're not taking into account in his situation. And more and more, the insurance companies are asking, demanding that medical science run itself on the basis of uh, the, the results of an artificial intelligence program, which is mechanical and leaves out so much vital information. So don't we need to understand the limits of our rationality, the limits not of our human capacity for higher intelligence, but the limits of the way we're applying this instrument which has been so powerful and generated so many results for us that we tend to uh, uh, we tend to think it's got all the answers, and the scientists think it has all the answers. Back in 2008, uh, about the time we started this project, there was a book that came out. I'd recommend it to anybody who's interested in the subject called "The Trouble of Physics," the trouble with physics, and by a, a Harvard physicist, a string theorist named Lee Smollin. The book is very, very well written, and it shows you how physics has evolved as a science in brilliant ways. Uh, and in the last part of it, he talks about string theory. And he explains how string theory has been reduced from a science to a religion, and from a religion to an orthodoxy, uh, to the point where if you work among the string theorists, if you don't agree with what they say, uh, they say you're, they say of people like that, they're just too stupid to understand because the whole reality is explained by mathematics. Well, I was so excited when we read this book that I called up Lee Smolin and I said, Lee, you know, you're talking about exactly the kind of issues that we want to study in the academy and we'd love to have a conference with you or a, a seminar with you to discuss it. And he says, please leave me out of this. <laughs> please just ignore me, forget my book. He got into so much trouble as a physicist because he went and questioned the basic rationality of his most rational of disciplines, if not the queen or king of sciences, the physics comes uh, next, next in line. Uh, and uh, uh, he didn't want to have anything to do with somebody who's questioning the rationality of science, though he had written a very wonderful book on it, which was very rational in itself. Beyond that, there are other levels, and I just want to touch on it very briefly. It's not a magic word. The next level we call intuition. Reason comes to explain something. The, the, it's the intuition that discovers. It's the reason that comes to harvest the results and claim the discovery later. And even Karl Popper, the philosopher of scientists, he's a philosopher, he's a logical, rational guy. He says, the evidence is that the great scientific discoveries have not been arrived at by logical processes. Logical doesn't mean they're irrational. Not by the normal mental processes that we consider one plus one, by relationship, by analytic, analytic thinking or systems thinking. They have come by spontaneous processes we don't understand. And the funny thing is that this is not something very, if this is true, 
that our greatest discoveries came from a process that's not the scientific method, the empirical method, the uh, analytic thinking or the systems thinking. Uh, isn't it makes sense that every scientist should be studying these processes and trying to understand them, even if not ever anybody's capable of it? Eight years ago, Evo and I wrote an article on the uh, on genius, which was published in Cadmus. And we took examples of genius and we took a look at some of the things they had in common, the genius had in common with others. Uh, and it was very striking. They tended to look at, they looked at things that appeared to be unrelated to each other, like mass and like energy and matter, and saw relationships between them, like electricity and magnetism, Maxwell. Electricity and magnetism are, are, are so different as phenomena. You can't see the, elect, the magnetism. You can't touch it and get electrified. You can't feel it. But yet he discovered they were two com complementary aspects of a greater phenomenon. So I'm just illustrating it. There are patterns of intuition that if we understand, we can begin to look at things that appear to be contradictory to each other, appear to be unrelated to each other, and, and, and look for those relations rather than ignoring them because we one, this is different than that's different, which is what our analysis tells us. And I put this list up to, as my close for this uh, to say, because to me, the words on this page are among the most important things. They rank to me the most important things in life, whether it's happiness or health or peace, or society, or human security, which we're working on, or truth, or even wealth, or harmony, none, none of these phenomena can be described in terms of empiricism, analysis, or systems theory. They are all something that goes beyond that. Shouldn't we at least be trying to understand that? And just to bring it down to earth, what we've been doing in the academy, under different headings and everything was based on an understanding that we've got to go beyond reductionism. Alberto's constantly reminding us. We have to go beyond me mechanistic thinking. We've got to go beyond the, the social uh, constructions of reality and the, and, and the inherent in the conceptual systems and the premises that nobody challenges because it's too controversial. And when we think wider, when we dare to go beyond the conceptual system, we go into creative realms which reveal new opportunities. And I think this is fundamentally what the Academy is about. This has been a, 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 a concept that's been evolving over time, but the origin of it is essentially to say, if we're an Academy of knowledge, it's not an Academy of science, we're an Academy trying and seeking for knowledge which goes beyond science, it goes beyond art in some ways, what do we call knowledge and what would we consider reliable knowledge? And this diagram, we developed it about 12 years ago. And to me, it's been of tremendous guidance because in every new program we come to, we find there are some of these dimensions, whether it's the subjective dimension or the role of the individual, or value, the key value, role of values, uh, of integration, of, uh, of, uh, of the context within things. We're trying to look at a concept of knowledge that's much more holistic, organic, complete, and integrated than what we are, what we are taught is knowledge. And I don't say we succeed anywhere near enough, but I want you to know that we're trying, I'm trying certainly in our programming to develop this concept, enrich the concept. If I view the academy, if we view the academy and we put at the center of this, we want reliable knowledge, whatever that means uh, in, the, in the broadest, most integrated way uh, that integrates art and science, creativity and all together. How do we conceive? This is the way I conceive of the programs of the academy now 
in the context of global leadership. There are other contexts, but this is a pretty holistic concept because it covers all of human security. It covers all of the, the, the fields of life. It covers the main dimensions. It doesn't mean there aren't other ways to conceptualize it. But this is the way the board has approved this view as a way in which we're trying to conceptualize what we're doing in the academy, what we stand for. And it's important that we're not just looking at these different things uh, as separate entities. All of these are integrated aspects of the reality. And the, the leadership we need and the society we need and the security we need and the well-being we need is a product of all of them. It's not a product of one or separate. You can't develop them separately. So I'm sh I just wanted to share this to link what we've discussed today in the first of the mentoring programs, and I'm sure they're going to be wonderful programs in the future, and so that you can give thought to this. How do we bring more and more of this kind of thinking into the work we do in the academy and, and in YLN as well, and in our association with other organizations?